Um, this morning we had 63 in Sunday school and a year ago 104. Uh, we've decided that somehow there must be a ratio of population to minutes preached. So we're thinking maybe we get out here really early. <laughs> okay, maybe not. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, coming up, we have the uh, church directory online. Um, it is online currently, so log in and take a look. There's instructions here in your bulletin on how to do that. And uh, if you have problems, get with the church office. Um, coming up next, well, yeah, coming up next week, the nominating committee is uh, starting their work for the year, and there will be a special business meeting next week. Uh, just to vote on a few final positions. Um, there will be no evening service this evening because of the 4th of July weekend. Uh, offices will be closed tomorrow, so nobody will be around. Thursday night, there is the get-together at Stovall's for the men, so men get together at 6 o'clock over there. Um, also, we need volunteers for the Bethel Association Youth Camp on Tuesday, July 12th. Um, there's several options there, and I'm not real sure who's in charge of that, who the contact person is for that. So um, I guess if, you're, if you have questions about that, maybe just contact the office and Angela can point you in the right direction. Looks like possibly. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board, I guess, so I'm, I'm not sure who the contact person is. Um, VBS will be coming up before you know it, the 25th through the 29th. Um, if you want a t-shirt, you need to get that in by July the 6th, which is this week. And if you have any questions about VBS or are interested in it, get with Kyla McMillan. Also, there will be no Terrific Tuesdays this week due to the holidays. So um, that's the only things I had. Mark, you want to say something about the fish fry? Good morning, church family. Uh, you have 17 days until our fish fry that we're gonna have here, July the 20th. It is a Wednesday night. It's gonna be the last terrific Tuesday on a Wednesday night, if that confuses anybody anymore. <laughs> and we're gonna, it's gonna be a carry-in, but the fish is provided by a man named Bobby Whitley. Uh, he's not a member of our church, he's just a friend, and he wants to do this. Uh, uh, he'll provide however much fish we need. He's gonna need six gallon of oil, he said, and 20 pounds of potatoes and then we bring the rest. Uh, so we're gonna have it in our church basement. Could be a hot day that day, but put, uh, spread the word around. This is a community thing to invite people to come and just visit. Uh, a lot of people don't know what we do inside these walls. Uh, this is a chance to meet people in this town. And uh, just put the word out, July the 20th, a Wednesday night, it's gonna start around six o'clock. Bobby says he's got enough crew to cook and do all that, but I'd appreciate a lot of people here just to visit and thank him and um, I don't know how many we'll have I told he keeps wanting to know a number there's no way to know a number I told him 150 to 250 so I'd love to have that many thank you all okay anybody else have anything that we missed okay Excited to worship the Lord with you? There we go. Uh, my voice isn't loud enough. None of you knew that before. But um, anyways, uh, happy 4th of July. Before we get started with worship, I do think uh, it's appropriate to always be thankful to those. Uh, the Bible tells us, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 3 tells us, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 tells us, you know, to uh, pray and be thankful for those, uh, even uh, political leaders and such, that uh, when we are able to live tranquil and quiet lives, which is pleasing to the Lord. So I do think it's appropriate to recognize on the 4th of July of those who have uh, put their life on the line to, to help us build a country uh, where we can live that way. Uh, so if our veterans and military people would stand so we can recognize you and say thanks to you, that would I'd appreciate it. And
And on that note, if you're a first-time guest with us, there should, be a, uh, there should be a little card in front of you in your pew. If we can just have a little bit of information about you, we're a church reaching out to people, and we want to reach out to people. And so uh, we'd love for you to put that in the offering plate, and that's the only thing we ask, uh, ask you to give the church is just a little bit of information so we know how we can minister to you. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much. Uh, for another day to worship you, another day to offer praise to you. Lord, you are good, and you are loving, and you are kind. And Lord, it's because of your kindness and your goodness toward us, and your mercy toward us, that you sent your Son to the cross, that we can now come to you and worship you, stand in your presence, and it be a good thing. Lord, help us to celebrate you this morning. Lord, we pray for those. We pray for uh, all those who are sick right now. We pray for Lon uh, and for uh, a quick recovery for him. And Lord, we thank you so much for John stepping in and filling in with worship, Lord. We just pray that you'll fill him with your Holy Spirit as he leads us and fill us all as we praise you this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Would you be free from the burden of sin? Would you, be, would you or evil a victory win? There is power in the blood of the name of Jesus. So let's stand as we sing. There's power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's God. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Since things are lost in the life-giving flow, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the land. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. You may be seated. So I made a couple of changes in Lon's schedule this morning. Sorry, Lon. Uh, the next hymn is Victory in Jesus, and uh, I'd like to read the verse connected with that. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through, the, through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. <laughs> I heard an old, old 
story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and brought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath a cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and fought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He brought me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. Put about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath a cleansing flood. And our offer for him is My Country Tis of Thee. Since to tomorrow is Independence Day, we'll sing the first two and last stanzas. We'll stand again. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let free. My heart with wrath. 
God, to the author of liberty, to I ran into a young man in the congregation this morning that I would have known, but most importantly, he knows my dad, uh, Johnny, I'm talking about you. <laughs> and uh, as I was thinking about this song that I want to sing for you today, you know, the, he says that I loved your dad, and there was nothing better for me to, to have somebody say, well, you're like your dad, or, or, or Sometimes people say, oh, you're such a good husband to Angela. Or the other day I had somebody tell me, you're the best maintenance man we've ever had. You know, I'm a maintenance man at the YMCA, basically. And so, you know, you hear those things and it makes you feel good. But, you know, there's nothing better, I think, in this world than somebody saying to you, you know, you're, you're like Jesus. I think that ought to be a goal for all of us. To hear someone say to us, you know, you were, you were, there's something about you. There's something different about you. And, and for us as believers, so often what the difference is, is it's Christ in us. And it's what Christ has done for us. In the book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, we find out that it was in Antioch where the people that followed Christ were first called Christians. And Christian basically means a version of or a, a type of. And, and, and what better description of us as God's people to be, you're a little version of Christ or you're a, a version patterned after Christ. So I can't think of a better thing that can be said of us. And today, the, the song I want to sing to you, it's, it's just a simple hymn. It's I'll tell the, I, I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. And if you know it, follow along with me. I'll be glad to have you join me. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed his name to bear. 
tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll take him with me anywhere. I'll tell the world how Jesus saved me and how he gave me a life brand new. And I know that if you trust him, that all he gave me, he'll give to you. I'll tell the world that he's my savior. No other one could love me so. My life, my all is his forever. And where he leads me, I will go. I'll tell the world that he is coming. It may be near or far away, but we must live as if his coming would be tomorrow or today for when he comes and life is over for those who love him there's more to be eyes have never seen the wonders that he's preparing for you and me Oh, tell the world that you're a Christian. Be not ashamed his name to bear. Oh, tell the world that you're a Christian and take him with you everywhere. Amen. Does the world see that we're Christians by the way we live our lives, by the way we uh, love, by the way we celebrate victory? Um, before we get into this text, let me pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for a day, another day to celebrate victory. Lord, we do thank you that we get to live in a place of peace where we can celebrate your victory, but Lord, we acknowledge that above all, our victory and our freedom comes from you. True freedom is our freedom from the curse of sin and death that you provide for us on the cross. True victory is victory in you because without you, nothing else really matters. Lord, help us to sense that victory as we go into your word Fill us with your truth. Help us to see your word as you intended by your Apostle Paul. Help us to take in this text, to be full of your Holy Spirit, to know it accurately, to take it to heart, and to celebrate victory in you, who transforms us, who makes us new. And we'll be sure to give you praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this morning we're continuing our study in 1 Corinthians. We're getting close to the end. We're at the end of chapter 15, and I've titled this Transformed. Uh, We're going to be in chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. And this is a passage that speaks about victory. And victory is something that feels really, really good. And and I feel a little shortchanged because it seems like every time that I'm that I have to be gone, whether I'm at the, at the base or whether I'm, uh, my kids have a ball game or whatever, it seems like our church league softball team has the best games when I'm gone. And so I'm missing out on some of these glorious victories that they speak of. I'm starting to wonder if they're playing a trick on me, if this is really real. Um, cause, but 
victory makes you feel good. It completely changes your outlook on things. Even in some minor silly thing like that, a ball game or something, causes you to walk away just a little bit more joyous. Victory over some major life challenge does wonders for your maturity and perspective. And just seeing how God carries you through something. If our focus is on Christ, we're able to live our lives celebrating victory over every struggle, over every sin, over every sorrow that this world could possibly throw our way because of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Because He overcame the world and He shares that victory with His people. We need to see this more clearly so that we can rejoice in it more abundantly. I say this all the time. The greatest need of every church is to have a clearer vision of Christ. A truer, a clearer vision of the Gospel. Because the more clearly we see Christ, the more intimately we know Him, if this is a relationship, then the more faithful we become. Up to this point in his discussion on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians, Paul's established the historical reliability of Christ's resurrection in the first 11 verses of the chapter. He's talked about the theological ramifications of his resurrection in verses 12 through, uh, through 14. He's addressed, and really through verse 34, he's addressed God's power to resurrect bodies in verses 35 through 41. He's distinguished between earthly bodies and heavenly bodies in verses 42 through 49, and now in the closing verses of chapter 15 on his discussion about the resurrection, Paul concludes his argument for the resurrection of the dead by emphasizing that the polarity between earthly and spiritual bodies will be overcome when God transforms both the living and the dead. The body that was unfit for heavenly existence that we live in now will be transformed to suit a heavenly existence. So the main point as we walk through 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58 is this. Salvation brings victorious change. Victorious change. Look at verses 50 through 58. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Salvation brings victorious change. Our points are simple. If it brings victorious change, the first thing we see out of verses 50 through 52 the point number one, salvation brings change. Salvation brings change. Look at verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. What's dying can't live forever. A dying body cannot go on eternally. Thank the Lord for that. Because we want our bodies made new. Because we suffer injuries. We have things happen to us like arthritis and organ failures and other things like other ailments. We need a new body to be able to enjoy eternity. 
Just as a dying body cannot live forever, a dying soul cannot live forever in the Lord. We need to be made new inwardly, which God does for us at salvation. And we need to be made new bodily, which God will do when Christ returns. The perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. A perishable, a perishing soul is unfit for God's presence and needs to be made new. You can't just live your way and expect to be able to stand in God's presence. Not in a perishing soul. A perishing body is unfit for God's new creation and needs to be made new. That's what Paul is rounding out this discussion to say. The evidence then of our salvation in Christ, here and now, is that inward change, that inward being made new. We still live in bodies that crave sin, and bodies that often, through those cravings, lead us into sin. We saw last week, or was it week before? We saw week before last that, that you know, the three things that hold us in bondage to sin out of Ephesians chapter 2 that we see are the influence of the world, the influence of our body's cravings, and Satan working behind those things. And we live in these bodies that crave sin, we're led into sin, and our bodies have corruptible minds that are often influenced by the world around us to sin because our bodies have not gone, yet gone through this transformation that if we're in Christ, that our souls have gone through. But inwardly, there's that change, and we don't accept our sin. We desire holiness if we're in Christ. This is the dilemma that Paul describes in Romans 7, verses 22 through 24, where he says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, this body. Wretched man that I am, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? You see, before salvation, mind and body goes after sin and accepts it. Even when we know better. That's why we hear people make excuses such as, this is just who I am. This is my life, but out. Things like that when it comes to sin. And that's why as Christians, we can look at certain ways that people live in and excuse sin and be simply baffled at how people don't see how foolish it is and how mindless the reasonings and excuses are. But we can fall into that too when we're not living right as Christians. Sin and idolatry affects us and makes us do really foolish things. It's just like a rutting buck. He gets that scent of that doe in heat. And this, these big deer that were once reclusive and you don't see them all year start literally running into the sides of cars. You, you can tell from my dinged up fender last year from about a 140 inch buck that just ran into the side of my truck. And, the, and they just do stupid things like that. Why? Because they've got one thing on their mind. They've got that scent. And all of a sudden, their minds aren't working the way they normally do. That's what sin does to us. When we get caught up in some sin, it starts making us do things, controlling us, that we normally would never do. But we're responsible for it. We'll pay a penalty for it. If we're not covered by the blood of Christ will eternally suffer for it. Suppressing the truth. Suppressing the truth. Romans 1, 21-22 says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. He goes on later in that discussion in verse 28 of Romans 1, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. See, when we let sin reign in our life, 
basically to put it in Midwestern terms, it stupefies us. But as Christians, we progressively are called to live out Romans 12 too. This says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may be able to discern what is the good will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. As Christians, we're born again. We're made new inwardly. So as we continue learning and growing in the Lord, our minds become transformed more and more away from sinfulness and increasingly toward holiness. So the Christian, a person born again and made new, fixates more and more on heavenly things and how to please God, while the person dead in their sins fixates more on and more on how to please themselves or, or things in this world here and now. Salvation brings change. It brings change. Not change as in you're perfect and you'll never struggle with sin or whatever, but a change in desires, a change in perspective, because inwardly your soul has been reborn to be fit for heaven when Christ returns and when He returns, our bodies will do the same. So look at verse 51. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We don't know when Christ will return. We are not going to know until that happens. Or else He wouldn't come as He described like a thief in the night. Mark 13, 32, Jesus said, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So we know that anybody who claims to have timed Christ's return coming is a liar. It's a mystery. God wants it that way because He has purposes in that. What we do know and this is what Paul's getting at. Not all will fall asleep, but all will be changed. We know that obviously, people historically from Christ's resurrection until his return will die, right? And then be raised from the dead at Christ's return bodily. But other followers of Christ will still be alive and not taste death, but be inwardly tra or instantly transformed. Look at verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. This is fascinating. This change happens in an instant. Imagine how amazing it would be if Christ were to return now, and you and I, our children, our grandchildren, would be spared the process of dying. In one instant, we're carrying on with life as usual, and then, blink of an eye, man, I missed that snap. There we are. In the blink of an eye, we're in a resurrected body, and in Christ's presence, with all made right and perfect. Never had to experience the pain of dying or say goodbye or anything. I've talked with so many people who fear Christ's return, claiming Christ, but also fearing His return. Well, I want to experience this. I want to experience this. You're not going to miss anything. What a blessing. We should be very excited for Christ's return. We should be praying for Christ's return if we're saved. But if you have not experienced salvation and you have not had that inward change of being born again into Christ, Christ's return, which could be any moment, is a dreadful thing. Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15 says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. 
Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is not a game to play with. God is serious about sin because He's serious about holiness. If God were not serious about sin, He would not be good. And He would not be holy. He's serious about sin. And we will either die to it now and turn to Christ or we'll experience a second death and eternal punishment. God is in control. We are His creation. And we have rebelled against Him. Praise the Lord that He sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to die on that cross and experience death for us if we turn and follow Him. And He rose to do life, to pave the way for us to experience eternal life through Him, like a new and greater Adam, as we saw Paul explaining earlier in the chapter. Have you been reborn into Christ? Don't play a game with time. If He's calling Turn to Him and accept that call so that you can look forward to the day when He returns. This promise that God will act suddenly, this is nothing new. This is how He's operated throughout the Scriptures. This is how God brings judgment throughout the Old Testament. People given chance to repent over and over and over again, and then at some point it's too late for them. And judgment comes on swiftly and suddenly on those who refuse to turn to the Lord and be saved. We see it over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. And you might ask, well, what about the person who has no access to the gospel? I hear this question all the time. Romans 1 tells us that creation itself should cause us to recognize the Lord. Romans 1.20, for His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. But what do you think happens then if somebody falls under that conviction? Do you not think that God would send somebody across any type of barrier like He did with sending Peter to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10? We see it in the Bible. I read a story this week about an unreached village where several people had the same dream of a flock of sheep gathered around a shepherd and then another flock of a different color mixing in with them. And then another dream of a man distributing bread and red drink. And then another dream of people in the village being dunked underwater and risen back out of the water. And realizing that several people were having the same dream they approached their Hindu priest who had no explanation. And so then they went to a diviner who had no answer. But of all people, this magician told them where they could find a pastor that he knew of who might have answers that could help them. The pastor explained those dreams with the gospel. And 21 people were saved. We hear stories like that. We see it in the Bible as well. Yet we want to question God's goodness. His care for people who will turn to Him and be saved and made new, we want to question that. What we should be questioning and wondering is, why would He allow us to be saved? Why would He allow anybody to be saved? God is fierce and serious about sin, and about His wrath because He's serious about holiness. But as the Old Testament describes His character over and over again, as He described it to Moses when He passed before, passed Him by in the rock on Mount Sinai, He's gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Will you embrace His steadfast love before it's too late? Next, out of verses 53-58, through we see Not only does salvation bring change, it brings victory. Salvation brings victory. Look at verse 53. 
For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. This change needs to take place because what's corruptible is not acceptable for God's presence. We're inwardly changed and the Holy Spirit dwells in us and that gives us victory. And we look forward to this same reality bodily when we get to stand in God's presence. This clothing imagery of putting on the imperishable It's calling to mind Old Testament passages such as Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 that says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, as speaking of a repentant Israel, Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Courtroom scene, Satan accusing because that's what he does. And that's what his name means in the Hebrew. And the Lord said to Satan, Yahweh rebuke you, O Satan. Yahweh who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. For is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua, standing before the angel of the Lord, was clothed in filthy garments. There was grounds for the accusations. There was sin. Can't you see yourself there? And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. You see, though we continue to live in sin, in this body where we find ourselves struggling with sin, We can get so down on ourselves because Satan accuses us and tears us down for all of our failures. And just as Joshua stood in filthy rags signaling his sin, Satan wants to pull all that up, pull up old sin. And God intervenes himself and rebukes Satan. Sorry if I jolted you a little bit, but I figured to be accurate to the text... I should try my best in my weak human way to give a little bit of the shock that God would have when God Himself rebukes Satan. And then claims you as His own. If you struggle with false guilt, guilt over things you've done and repented of, given over to the Lord, yet it keeps dragging you down, and you keep letting people drag you down, you keep letting Satan drag you down, you know, pop culture way of doing it is just saying, you know, rebuke Satan or whatever, but what if you let God do it? What if you go to God, because what what we're reading here in this, what I read in this Zechariah passage is God doing this. Ask the Lord to intervene on your behalf and rebuke Satan. We can go to the Lord for that. He is our defender. He defends us powerfully and with all authority. As Christians, though we carry filthy rags in this life, we live knowing the victories here as well. It was won on the cross and Christ's resurrection from the dead. We've been plucked from the fire. We have clean garments graciously given to us by the Lord and a pure body graciously in our future waiting for us when Christ returns. Inwardly, we're cleansed and bodily we will be too. Cleansed, pure, and ready to stand in God's presence for all of eternity. Psalm 104.1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, You are very great. You are clothed in splendor and majesty. And reflecting God's image as a new creation, He clothes us in Christ's righteousness if we're His. Look at verses 54 and 55. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, 
death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? What Paul does here, if, you ever, if you're reading your Bible and you read where a New Testament author is quoting an Old Testament text, and, it, and you go to that Old Testament text and it doesn't quite add up, there's what's usually taking place is a, liter, a, a Greek literary device called an ellipsis, where they take ideas from multiple texts of Scripture and combine it into one statement. What Paul's doing here is he's, take, he's combining two Old Testament quotes here, Isaiah 25, 8, which is a passage that speaks of all nations coming to the Lord, and Hosea 13, 14, which taunts death's feebleness before God's power to forgive sins and overcome death. And so what Paul's showing is that this victory over death will be fully realized when Christ returns and people who have been saved by God's grace from all nations will experience this decisive victory over death. Will you be among them? Will you? This is why we can live in such victory and be joyful. The world may try to convince people otherwise. But you ever notice how pleasant and joyful God's people tend to be? I mean, seriously. I, a lot of times when, when our church does some sort of outreach to people out in the world, uh, we had a great example of this a couple weeks ago when we had our New London Yard Sale giveaway day. People were just overwhelmed by the kindness of our church. Why would you do this for me? Well, because it's nothing compared to what Jesus did for us. Kindness of God changes us. It makes God's people pleasant to be around. And it's because we live in victory. It changes, victory changes your perspective on things. It makes you a more pleasant person to be around. The world lives in defeat. And you can see it all over the attitudes and the mood of society, right? The world is living in defeat. But we're truly different. We are truly different in Christ because Christ has already won our victory over this world and God's people will act like it. Because we believe it. And if you're not acting like it, it's because your vision of Christ is getting skewed by this world. And it's time to turn back to the Lord in your perspective. We don't deny the struggles we face here and now. We certainly face grief and struggle. And the Bible makes that very clear. But our perspective is not here and now. Our perspective is eternal. And our perspective is full of victorious hope. Psalm 138.8 says, The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. We know that no matter what we face, the Lord will fulfill His purpose in us. And if God is our delight, Psalm 37.4, Delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. If God is our delight, the desires of our heart are Him and He'll give us more of Him. And it makes us more joyful and victorious. Look at verse 56. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Christ Himself absorbed the sting on the basis of how His death and resurrection addresses the problem of sin and the law and our inability to fulfill the law. Because of the resurrection, death's sting has been drained of its poison and cannot harm God's people. And we'll be raised with imperishable bodies because of Christ who precedes us in His resurrection. Paul identifies the sting of death as sin here, which is recalling Eden, right? In the fall. And it reminds us of the permanent separation from God if we don't have that identity in Christ. For the unbeliever, the law works as an ally to sin because it makes people more aware of sin and magnifies sin. 
Romans 5 talks about that. But Christ has overcome it all. Look at verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul gives thanks to God who accomplishes this victory by grace, not by human achievement. In verse 38, he likened the resurrection to God giving a naked seed a body. And in verse 57, he unpacks that illustration further to show that Christ giving his people resurrection bodies is part of what it means to have victory, ultimate victory over sin. All of it. Forgiveness of sins, victory over death, resurrection. It comes through the victorious death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Without Christ, there is no victory. Without Christ, there is no forgiveness. Without Christ, there's only condemnation and the looming curse of death. But with Christ, there's hope. With Christ, there's salvation. With Christ, there's forgiveness. With Christ, there's the joy of victory over sin and death. And look at verse 58. Therefore, with all this in mind, therefore, my beloved brothers, what do we do with all this? Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Because of Christ's resurrection, so long as we remain steadfast in Him, staying faithful, our labor and our sufferings and the things we go through in this world will never be in vain. Do you realize that if you are in Christ, you will never suffer in vain. You will never suffer without a purpose. No matter how hard it is, you'll never die in vain if you die in faithfulness to the Lord. And you'll rise. In a world that influences us, to doubt and to be tossed around by every fear and every current issue, Christ's resurrection is all we need to be immovable because He's already won the victory and overcome the world. The hope of final victory over sin and death should motivate us to endure and to labor in this present age knowing that the Gospel makes a difference, that the Gospel has eternal effects. And having this future in front of us, we don't need to be discouraged by our own weaknesses because Christ will transform us. Therefore, we can labor for the gospel knowing that whatever our weaknesses, our labor will never be in vain. Our efforts are never in vain. Can you honestly say this about your life? Can you honestly say that you are bound to Christ in His death and His burial, and His resurrection? Or do you feel like you're just spinning your wheels and running in vain as this world just tosses you around with whatever tosses the world around at the moment? Perhaps it's time to hand your life over to the Lord and be risen to new life in Him. If you sense Him calling you to do that, go to Him in prayer. Tell Him you believe He died and rose again for you. Ask Him to save you, give you His Holy Spirit. If there's anything you want the church to know, to join the church, to, or anything that the Lord's laid on your heart, we invite you to come as we sing our closing song. Let me pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the victory that you won for us. Lord, we can live our lives in victory every moment, no matter what comes our way, because you are our champion. You are our Savior. Lord, we love you. We trust in you. Lord, we pray that you will be gracious and merciful to us in every way as we put our hope in you. And let every person in this room lay their hope in you and live our lives walking with you and sitting at your feet, Jesus. Reflecting you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Our invitation hymn is 455 in times like these.
times like these you need a savior in times like these you need an anchor be very sure be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock this rock is jesus yes he's the one this rock is jesus the only one be very sure be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock Amen. Praise the, Lord. the Lord with you this morning and um no, no evening service tonight, like it was mentioned. Uh, we'll go uh, celebrate the 4th of July by uh, eating food and blowing stuff up, America style. And, <laughs> and uh, no, we'll, uh, it'll be good. Just enjoy the time with your families. And, uh, and no, uh, no there, aren't, there isn't a softball game, but there's a thing at the men's group at Randy's house on Thursday. And uh, no terrific Tuesday because of the holiday week as well. Uh, so... We'll, uh, Lord willing, we'll see you again next Sunday, and just keep keep people in your prayers. We're missing about half our church this morning from uh, different illnesses and things, and so just um, just keep folks in your prayers, and just reach out to people, and uh, and just uh, check in on one another, and uh, just make sure people are doing well. And I encourage you to do that. And Lord willing, we'll meet again next week. So uh, on that note, I'm asked Tommy Dotson if you'll close us in prayer.